Hello viewers, 4DIYers here with another tutorial video for everyone. In this particular video here, I'll be doing a demonstration on how to replace an O2 sensor, also referred to as an oxygen sensor, on your vehicle without using a acetylene torch, along with how to diagnose it, both using a multimeter and graphic scan tool. Bosch has been kind enough to provide me with the parts required for the replacement in order to produce this video. This particular car I am working with here today is a 1997 BMW 540i. Typically, a faulty oxygen sensor can cause rough idling, poor performance, increased fuel consumption, and will trigger a check engine light. They may have different effects on different engines and last about 160,000 kilometers or 100,000 miles, but this can vary between vehicles and driving styles. For this car, considering it's a V8, the engine is broken into two banks, and there is also a pre and post O2 sensor. When we do have the hood open, facing the engine, bank 1 is on the left and bank 2 is on the right. Bank 1 typically starts where cylinder number 1 is. Therefore, four O2 sensors in total, two on each bank, and this car has two catalytic converters for each bank. In this case, the sensors will be broken down into bank 1, sensor 1, or bank 1, sensor 2, and bank 2, sensor 1, or bank 2, sensor 2. Now if you scan the codes, there will be O2 sensor faults. This doesn't always mean the O2 sensor is actually faulty. Considering the O2 sensor measures the amount of unburned oxygen in your exhaust, then you could have a faulty sensor throwing off the mixture, an improper combustion burn, vacuum leak, exhaust leak, broken wire, corroded electrical connector, or the catalytic converter isn't functioning correctly. If an O2 sensor fault is ignored for a longer period of time, this can also damage your catalytic converter, which can be very expensive to replace. We can use a scan tool to not only read the fault codes of the computer, but also have the live data stream to see how the sensor is performing. This should be done when the engine is at full operating temperature, therefore the engine is running in a closed loop. In an open loop, the engine is still warming up and uses preset parameters, therefore not using the oxygen sensor. This particular scan tool can measure voltage readings and view live data stream of a wave form. Checking the first sensor, B1S1 means bank 1, sensor 1, so before the catalytic converter. For voltage, we can view a minimum and maximum reading. Typically, an O2 sensor before or pre-catalytic converter should see a wide range, anywhere from 0.1 volts to 0.9 volts. If a sensor is showing a higher voltage range, for example, 0.35 volts to almost 1 volt, then the mixture is running rich. If the reading is lower, for example, almost 0 volts to 0.55 volts, then the mixture is running lean. In this case, the mixture is running on the leaner side. If the range of the voltage is quite close, for example, 0.3 volts to 0.55 volts, then the sensor isn't functioning correctly. This graphic data shown is called a waveform, with the highs and lows the medium or middle should come around 0.45 volts, meaning that we have a perfect air fuel ratio of 14.7 to 1. When I snap the throttle quickly to the floor, the engine is forced to run on a rich mixture, then release it back quickly, forcing the engine to lean the mixture. This should show on the data. You can see the spike on the waveform here. After that, it leans out to account for the extra fuel and finally returns back to normal. We should see a high and low spike and this ensures the sensor is reading correctly. You can also force the engine to run rich by disconnecting the temperature sensor, sometimes running a resistor to it, or lightly spraying fuel into the throttle body. For leaning a mixture, simply disconnect the vacuum line. For after or post catalytic converter, when using the scan tool, the operation will be different. The waveform on the graph will be tighter, showing something between 0.3 to 0.6 volts instead, or even narrower, with a medium of 0.45 volts. 
Values may vary between vehicles. I'm using generic examples for this tutorial. As you can see, this vehicle is still showing a tighter range, but has spikes, which can indicate unburned pollutants. This vehicle unfortunately does have an issue with the catalytic converters. I already know both are broken. This particular car does have a four-wire system, which is quite common amongst most vehicles on the road today. Sensors originally started out with a single wire system, then switched over to a two wire system, eventually having three, and then some vehicles even having five wires now. Being that this vehicle has two different circuits, one for the heater and the other for the sensor, either can fail. First checking over the sensor while it's still installed in the vehicle. Inspect the wire for any damage which can cause a short or a broken wire, both causing error issues. Also inspect the sensor if it's bent, this can indicate a broken sensor. Unplug the connector then, check for any corrosion within each of the plugs and clean if necessary. Test the resistance on the sensor's heater circuit using the new sensor for an example as a good baseline. Go to the lowest resistance setting on your multimeter and probe the plug with the two white wires. Manufacturer specs may vary between vehicles, but as a generic resistance value, you should see no higher than 30 ohms. If there is no reading or it's outside of that range, the element is faulty and would not allow the sensor to monitor accurately. Next, we need to determine if the heater circuit is getting power. Clear the codes on the vehicle to ensure the circuit hasn't been turned off by the vehicle's computer due to a fault code. This would be on the two white wires coming from the sensor. I am back probing the plug. I find it's easiest to do this on the sensor side as it doesn't have a boot over the rear of the plug. I typically use doll needles for this. Push them in the back between the wire insulation and the rubber seal on the weatherproof connector. Do not pierce the wire as this can cause corrosion issues in the future. Plug the sensor back in and test the circuit while it does have a load. Set your multimeter to the two digit DC voltage setting and test with the ignition either on or the vehicle running. This may vary between vehicles. Oxygen sensors later came with a separate heater circuit in order to help promote reliability for sensor readings. It needs to operate at a minimum of 315 degrees Celsius or 600 degrees Fahrenheit. If there is not power present at the plug, this could mean a fault with the plug, wiring, or perhaps something going back to the computer. Just like before, in order to test the function of the sensor, the vehicle must be warmed up at full operating temperature so we can toggle between a rich and lean mixture. I am still working with the new sensor so this gives you a good idea how responsive a new sensor is. Turn the key off, remove the needles, and now place them back in the black and gray wires. Turning the multimeter onto the lowest DC voltage setting like before, connect the probes and start the engine. Considering I'm working with a digital multimeter, the readings may be a little lagged versus when you use an analog meter. Once the engine is warmed up, you can see we're hovering around the middle value of 0.45 volts, and this does fluctuate from time to time. Now when I snap the pedal to wide open throttle, just like before we can see a high spike, which demonstrates a rich mixture. When the pedal goes back to normal, we see a low spike indicating that the mixture has leaned out, and the computer is trying to compensate for that burst of fuel. A rich or lean mixture can be forced in other ways, just like I mentioned previously when using the scan tool. If these values are lagged or isn't showing a high or low value when that rich or lean mixture is forced, then the oxygen sensor is faulty. I'll show you another test towards the end of the video on the old sensor too. For replacement, depending on the age, these can sometimes be a pain to replace, especially when you don't have acetylene torch set. With my replacements, in the past I have found this method to work quite well. Right before I remove the sensor, I will warm the vehicle up. Typically a catalytic converter operates at around 650 degrees Celsius or 1200 degrees Fahrenheit and that sensor is usually within close proximity so we have plenty of heat to work with. Both rust and soot will cause the sensor to seize so the heat allows for the bung to expand so the sensor can be removed. If you rather use a torch, that option will also help. 
Here I have a small propane powered torch, easily obtainable and cheap to own. The tip of the blue flame is the hottest point and that needs to be touching the bung. The bung is a threaded portion the sensor screws into. If you are still having issues, use a high quality penetrating oil. You can let it soak overnight and apply it more than once. But keep in mind, some penetrating oils are flammable, so have a hose or fire extinguisher handy. For removing the sensor, we can use a wrench, a regular deep socket, or an oxygen sensor socket. I was able to use a wrench just fine, but only the box end of the wrench. If you are using the open end, this can flex, risking the chance of stripping the hex. For a socket, a deep socket can also be used if you know for certain that the sensor is faulty or you're not reusing it. Then cut the wires off as close as possible. For a sensor socket, I don't have one of those unfortunately to show you, but these will have a slot on the side to accommodate the wire and have thicker walls to overcome the flexing. If you find the sensor is binding during removal, tighten it and add penetrating oil. This will help break up any loose debris within the threads and also provide some lubrication so the bung doesn't become damaged. As mentioned earlier, Bosch has provided me with the parts in order to complete this tutorial for you. Bosch is the OE supplier for BMW oxygen sensors. I usually like to stick with the manufacturer who supplied the parts for my car from factory as this ensures the sensor is high quality and will not fail prematurely while providing optimum performance. Compare the old and new sensor to ensure they are the same. As you can see, Bosch has also applied anti-seize to the threads in order to prevent the sensor from seizing in the bung. Do not get anti-seize on the sensing surface as this can cause issues. As you can see, we have a crush washer on the sensor. This provides a seal to prevent any leakage around the sensor. For installation, make sure the washer mating surface is clean, then thread in the new sensor. Careful with the wire. Ensure it does rotate along with the sensor so it doesn't add any strain or risk breaking. Tighten the sensor using the boxed end part of the wrench. For this particular car, we are looking at 41 foot-pounds or 55 newton meters as a torque value. Connect the plug and insert it back into the plastic protective case. Bolt the case back up to the underside of the body. Now finally for testing the old sensor while it's off the car. First testing the resistance of both white wires which is for the heater element. And as you can see we're within proper specifications. Next you can use a propane torch in order to determine if the sensor is producing voltage when heated. Just like before when it was on the exhaust. We can see the sensor producing a small amount of voltage which is supplied to the computer showing the air fuel ratio of the mixture. This method doesn't always tell if the sensor is reading correctly but will determine its functioning. Having the sensor in a secure position and then probing the wires, this time the black and grey. The multimeter needs to be on the lowest DC setting. When it's cold we should see a value of 0 volts. Heating the sensor, depending on the temperature, the sensor will produce a small amount of voltage. It should max out up or around 1 volt. Using my infrared thermometer, it's a little hard to get exactly on the sensor, but I did have a value over 300 degrees Celsius or 572 degrees Fahrenheit. So we should certainly see a voltage reading. In this case, we do not. And when I was viewing the live data for this particular sensor, I was seeing inconsistent values, so most likely a wire is broken on the sensor. New videos are released every week on my channel, so be sure to stay up to date with my video schedule by hitting that subscribe button. Don't forget to leave a comment below letting me know what you think of my tutorial. Thank you for watching.